Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, this is your host Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me tonight is going to be uh, Grant Cameron, he's got a new book out, UFOs Area 51 and Government Informants, that we're going to be talking about, and he's also the owner of the website, uh, presidentialufo.com, if you want to learn more information about them. Now, tonight we're going to be doing the show a little bit differently. I'm, uh, let's so, just say we're a little under the weather, so my co-hosts are going to take over for me, and they're going to help me out tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the show over to them, but I'm going to be around in the background while the show is going on. So, um, John, uh, Gerald, if y'all don't mind... I'll let y'all go ahead and step in real quick. Okay. Uh, I guess, Gerald, you can go ahead and get a start. Uh, thanks, Royce. I will. Um, Grant, again, thank you for coming on tonight. Um, Grant, if you could, just tell us a little bit about what you got going on, man. Uh, well, what I, I guess the big item I have going on right now is uh, we just uh, published a book, T. Scott Crane, who uh, was my co-author on the book. It's a republishing of a book that was published uh, by MUFON. It was the first book that MUFON published back in 1991. And uh, what happened was, uh, uh, is be- the, before the days of uh, Amazon.com, before the days of Internet, and back then uh, MUFON published the book, but basically unless you were a member of MUFON, uh, you couldn't get the book. So it, they published their 1,000 copies of the book, and it sold, and uh, so people high in the field, or people who are really into UFOs, MUFON people, they were sort of familiar with what was in the book. And then what happened was years later, uh, Richard Dolan was doing uh, UFOs, the National Security State, Part 2, and it dealt with uh, the period of time that uh, the book uh, that we did. Uh, so what happened was Richard took part of the material from the book, and stuck it in his uh, UFOs National Security Part 2. And uh, then he said to me, well, you know, maybe I'd like to republish the book. And I said, yeah, okay, fine. So uh, I spent, I guess it's been the last couple of years, and I really didn't take it serious. If I'd known it was going to do as well as it's doing, I would have spent a lot more time putting uh, some more material in it, because there's a lot of material I didn't put in the book. But uh, I rewrote it, and I guess I, I added about, we took out uh, some from the original book, and we added about 100 pages. So this is uh, the first book was called UFOs, MJ-12, and the Government. And uh, it w- during that thing, we were writing it when the M- when the Area 51 uh, situation was going on. We were dealing with uh, George Knapp and with uh, John Lear, all the people involved in the Area 51 thing. So what we did in the second book is we changed it from uh, UFOs, MJ-12, and the Government to UFOs Area 51 in the government because in the UFO community, if you've been around, you know, like myself, uh, you know, since almost since the beginning, you sort of know what MJ-12 is. But the general public, even though it's a very important subject, the general public has no idea what MJ-12 is. So that's why we changed the, the title to UFOs Area 51 and the government. And the, the Area 51 story uh, is basically there was nothing changed from the original story. We had it pretty accurate. It's just in the new version, I put what I think is the actual uh, truth of what happened at Area 51. The you know, there's been very various sort of spins on the story, but I think when you look at the evidence that that I presented in uh, this new book, it it basically explains exactly what happened there. Well, that sounds really interesting, Grant. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John for a second, but uh, please continue because. Sure. Everything's going great, man. I'm I'm really interested, and I'm listening, and I'm loving it. Beautiful. Okay, I was waiting for my grandfather clock to quit banging back there. It was chiming away. <laughs> <laughs> Came at a bad time. Well, Grant, <laughs> I was kind of curious about uh, any new developments that, in evidence that you might have gotten from Area 51 that's been released that uh, we're not aware of. Is there any of that information that you care to to kind of feed to us okay. that entice us a little? Sure. Uh, well, the original story, basically, the original story has uh, um, Bob Lazar, and everybody sort of knows that this guy, by the name of Bob Lazar, goes up to the test site, 
And then he comes out and he tells the story that he saw these nine flying saucers and uh, he had a you know, threat on his life and uh, he was filmed. The story became very famous. People started going up to Area 51 and then sort of the UFO community came across the fact that that the background that he was claiming with these two master's degrees, it didn't appear that he had it and uh, he really uh, still claimed he had it. And the story just sort of died out in terms of the research aspect to it. The story itself kept going. I mean, in fact, the, in 1995, the story broke in, uh, in spring of 1989 when uh, the chief investigative reporter at KLS TV, George Knapp, put, him, put Bob Lazar on TV and backlit him. And, I mean, the phone just came off the hook and the story went worldwide and everybody, every network wanted to go and do the story and stuff. So that that's basically the story that people know. And so what I did when I was updating the book, and we had done stuff in the original book. We'd done the stuff about tracking of the uh, the 115, whether they had the 115, whether they had put it on a set. They were interviewing Lazar, interviewing him, and that they uh, put, there was a rumored story they had put this 115 on the, uh, in this sort of canister that was held, and they put it in the, in the screenshots to show the government that they had it. And that they had buried some of this stuff in uh, in Las Vegas, the last piece that they had. Some of it was stolen back. And so it, during the 89 version, we were basically chasing all the stuff around trying to confirm these all these rumored stories. And so when I was redoing the new book and I said, well, you know, the story is pretty accurate. I looked at it and really nothing to change. But what I decided is, okay, I'll, this is a new generation. We've got all these inter, internet interviews with uh, John Lear and uh, um, Gene Huff, who was one of the key players, and uh, uh, George Knapp and Lazar. A lot of interviews I've done with Lazar. So I decided I would go and listen to all the interviews. And I spent a lot of time just tracking back all these different interviews. And I guess the key to what actually happened at Area 51 comes in an interview that George Knapp does with uh, John Lear and Gene Huff. And in that interview, John is talking. And John, uh, I've known John for a number of years. Well, I knew him since it began. Very interesting guy. I don't know if you ever had him on a show. But extremely interesting guy. And um, he he said a lot of very sort of controversial things in his lifetime. He sort of lives on the edge. The thing I know about John Lear is that John Lear is as honest as a day is long. He can say a lot of stuff like, you know, people are living on the moon and and stuff that a lot of people say, well, this is crazy, they don't believe it. But John believes it. I know that for a fact. So John basically, that was the whole the whole idea was that, that John was telling the truth. And so I knew a lot of the stories that he had told. And uh, I know that Bob Lazar had passed four lie detector tests. And I knew that Bob, that George Knapp believed the story, that he believed that this was true, that he had 24 plus other witnesses that were confirming the Bob Lazar story. So it was during this one interview with, with, uh, John Lear and Gene Huff when they talk about the interviews. What happened was in 1982, um, um, Lazar had been working at Los Alamos Labs and Edward Teller, the guy, the, the father of the hydrogen bomb, had come and he was giving a lecture there and happened to run into, he was reading the newspaper and on the front of the newspaper was this article about Lazar with his Honda with a jet engine in it. He was sort of reading the article and, and Lazar had come to the lecture. Teller was sitting outside the lecture hall and so he came up to him and he said, well, that's me on the front, front page there. And they sort of, they just sort of interacted and talked. So what happens is later on, this is 1988, sort of the late summer of 1988, John Lear meets uh, Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar, according to John Lear, had no interest in UFOs and just sort of uh, heard these conversations, saw John was a bit eccentric and sort of listened to the stories. And uh, so John gave him a couple of things to check out at Los Alamos Labs. One was what was called the Excalibur uh, Missile, and one was called the YY... Uh, it's a YYK2, the place where they kept a live alien at Los Alamos. And so Lazar went to uh, people he knew at Los Alamos because he was working there and basically confirmed that this, this stuff was true and started to believe John Lear was had something. So what happens is John says, well, you should go and, and work up at the test site because they've got this stuff up at the test site. So what happens in November of 1988, uh, Lazar phones up Edward Teller and says that he'd like to get back into the scientific community, and uh, Teller 
uh, calls him back and says, um, or he wrote him a letter and then Ted Teller phones him and says, well, where do you want to work? Do you want to work up at Livermore Labs where, where Teller was running the show or do you want to work up at the test site? And Lazar said, well, you'd like to work up at the test site. And then the key point, this is the key, key thing. If you understand what happened in, this, in these interviews, you understand what happens at Area 51. They go into the interviews, and as I said, Lear knew uh, Lazar through this incident where they were assessing his house, and Lazar was working with the assessor, who's Gene Huff. And uh, so in the first interview, they ask him all these technical questions, and Lazar says he knocks the thing out of the park. No problem. Second, second, and third, all were technical questions as well. And this is with E. G. and G. the mil, the uh, contractor, the major contractor up at the uh, the Nell's test site, the atomic test site. First question of the second interview was the only one that was the technical inter, uh, technical question, and that was the one that gave away what happened. They said to so the first question of the second interview was, "What's your association with John Lear, and what do you think about him?" Which means. They knew before Bob Lazar was ever taken up to the test site, they knew that he knew John Lear. And it's critically important to remember what the, what the time frame was. This was 1988. At the time, John Lear, his father was, of course, very famous for having invented the Lear jet. He was a very famous guy. He'd run for a senator in, in Nevada. Uh, he, in, in 1987, he had come across a guy who was involved in the Reynolds from Forest story. And so he got involved in UFOs. He suddenly believed this was for real and had, uh, done some investigation, the MJ-12 documents that come out at that time, and what he did was he started talking to everybody. He got his mother to phone General Doolittle, which is one of the sort of the pieces of evidence on MJ-12 that the skeptics very rarely ever talk about. Uh, his mother uh, knew all these famous people, and General Doolittle was one. John says, please phone up Doolittle and ask him if MJ-12 exists. And she took her six months. She really didn't want to do it. So finally she phones up Doolittle. She says, oh, John's gotten himself into this UFO stuff. And I just got one question. Is there, Was there such a thing as MJ-12? And, he's, and then General says, well, Moya, there was an MJ-12, but that's all, I can really, that's all I can really tell you. So John is really into this. And he becomes the state director from UFON for Nevada. And he also gets involved with Bill Cooper, who was uh, sort of really fairly famous. He was packing audiences, and he had all this weird stuff. And it turned out he's making up most of the stuff that he, that he was that he was talking about. But a lot of the stuff was really weird, like the underground base at, at Dulce, the big battle with the aliens, and uh, you know all sorts of really weird stuff that John was sort of promoting in uh, in in Las Vegas. In fact, in 1989, when the Lazar story broke. That was when the MUFON conference was held in Las Vegas, Nevada. And this is the one, the famous one where Bill Moore makes a speech about working for the government and people are throwing stuff at him and yelling. And it's the last speech he ever gives. He goes from the top researcher in, in ufology to somebody who absolutely nobody would believe anything he said. He just sort of lost his reputation. So John was in, in charge of setting up that MUFON conference. And what happened was that he wanted to bring in Bill Cooper, and he wanted to bring in Clifford Stone, and the MIFON director said, no, 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 we're John, we're going to pick the speakers. You can't bring, we can't have these people speaking. So they ran a conference, John runs his own opposing conference, and actually outdraws MUFON down the street. So John is a very famous guy at this time, and everybody seems to know where he is, which makes this question very significant with Bob Lazar, that this very significant guy who's running around talking about UFOs, knows this Bob Lazar. So when they sent him up to the test site, which is only a couple of weeks, a couple of days later, they sent him up to the test site. Where do they send him? Number one, they, would, they wouldn't send him up there. If they knew he was involved with, with John Lear, you know that John Lear is part of the game. And so they know that if they send him up to the test site, he's going to come back and he's going to tell John Lear everything that's going on. So it, it's, if it's the most highly classified subject in the United States, as has been claimed, why would you jeopardize the security of the operation and put up some guy that you're pretty sure is going to go? He's, he knows John Lear. John Lear's probably set him up to go down to the test site. And so they sent him up there, which means that they intended to have him up. They knew that he was going to go and leak this material to John Lear. And the, some of the evidence that backs that up is, is Lazar's background was rockets. He had a rocket rocket engine in his in his Honda, and he was driving around Las Vegas with this jet engine car. So do they send up to test site? There's 5,000 people working on rockets and, uh, you know, jet engines and, and all this kind of stuff. 
Do they send him up and work with those people? No, they send him up to the to S4 where there's only like two dozen people working, and they have this story that oh, some guy died in an explosion, and we had to replace him, and so you're the replacement, and they put him up there. And then some of the other evidence that people have to realize what happened is when you add up all the hours that the czar actually worked up at the test site, he was only there for a couple of days. He'd work a couple of hours, then he'd be he'd gone for a couple of weeks, and uh, he he really from like. This January to March of 1989, he really didn't work at the test site. He was just brought up near the end. And the other thing that sort of gives away what was going on is when I did some hiring and I did some some training of people, and you basically know that when you hire somebody, basically the first day that they're on the job, you basically show them where the washroom is, you show them where the lunchroom is, you basically, it's just an orientation day, you really don't do anything. Bob Lazar gets up there, the first thing they do is give him 125 pages of material, and everybody that's, that knows anything about UFOs or highly classified uh, black budget programs knows that you don't, you, you only get to need, you only have a need to know on what you need to know, that you, you don't know the whole program. And basically what they did is they dumped all these 125 pages, 25 documents on them that basically explained how the program worked, about the different, uh, the Galileo project and the, uh, the all the back engineering and the underground battle, except instead of Dulce, they had it happening at Area 51. And basically, as far as I'm concerned, they were setting him up. They wanted him to take this material, all this material, and everything that Lazar learned on, on Edis for up there, you can't believe any of that stuff because it's a setup. So probably some of it's true, some of it's false, and that's how they, they operate this game. They wanted the story out, the flying saucers were at Area 51, they, wa- they knew that Lazar would take it back and he'd give it to, to John Lear, which is exactly what happened. The first day that Bob Lazar saw a flying saucer there, he went back to John Lear's house. And John tells us, he's told this story numerous times. He said, I was sitting there, I was writing out checks, I was sitting at my desk, and Bob Lazar came in and he said, uh, oh, John, I just wanted to let you know I saw a saucer today. And John said, a saucer? Was it their saucer or was it our saucer? And he said, it was their saucer. And John says, well, what are you doing here? I mean, you know they're going to follow you. I mean, what are you telling me this for now? Why don't you stay at the test site for a couple of months, work for a couple of months, then come back and tell me what's going on. And he said, no, no, John. He said, you, you, I made fun of you when this first started, and, and I wanted to make sure that you knew what, 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 that, that you'd taken enough crap on this that I, want, I just wanted you to know. Gene Huff, the second key part is Gene Huff confirms that Lazar had told him that part of his job at S4 was to report on John Lear, what John Lear was doing with UFOs, what he, what he was thinking about it. And so it was very evident that not that Lazar was part of the program, that he knew what was going on, but they knew that he was going to take this material back. And the whole idea was, the, I say that there's a this gradual disclosure program that the government's operating, and this was this was part of what they were doing. They wanted him to take the material, which was partly true, partly false. They knew he had a bad background, that he was claiming he had to have this background. So what they would do is they would give him the material, partly true, partially false. He would take it to John Lear. John Lear would put it out along with all this Cooper material that he was was yakking about, which people knew was partly true, partly false. It was you know Cooper was kind of a crazy guy. So they knew that the, the material would all fall apart. The idea of the saucers at Area 51 would get out, but because of what John Lear was promoting the material, nobody was going to believe it. And once people found out that that Lazar had a bad background, they would all say it's a hoax, and everybody would go chasing after the next UFO story, and the story would get out without breaking the cover-up. That's what they want to do. They want to release the material that they have without destroying the cover-up, because once you spill the milk, you can't put it back in the in the in the in the glass. And what they're trying to protect is the classified material, uh, and that's why they're doing ha- part part true, part false. Is because it doesn't matter whether you're the president of the United States or whether you're Bob Lazar or John Lear. If you release classified material, you're going to jail. They're going to get you, and it's as simple as that. So the the way they do it is nothing is for real. Everything's fictionalized. The whole story's fictionalized. So John's going to put it out. The story's going to fall apart. And everybody's going to learn there's there's crafts at Area 51. What they didn't what they didn't figure on was in most stories when you release this kind of stuff, it sort of has a three day news cycle 
which I know because I was one of the people that was working on the Chase Brandon story last year when the CIA guy came up with this big story. And after about three or four days, if you've got a website, you can watch the numbers just dropping like a stone, that the story's just dying because the, most of the reporters who do these stories have to move on to the next story. They've got another deadline two days from now. What happened here was that George Knapp was the chief investigative reporter for KLS-TV. The thing just went crazy. I mean, it was like they, they were just sort of like it was instantaneously this massive story. They didn't realize that Bob Lazar was going to go to TV and that TV would take him seriously. Because usually, you, you you know, that how many reporters do it, they'll write up your story and then they'll, you know, put a skeptic at the end to balance the story or they'll put in the little wisecrack at the end of the story. So this is what happened in the Lazar thing was that, that it suddenly became very famous and George Knapp spent six to eight months working on the story and basically confirmed that the story was true, not from Lazar, but from various other people, including one high-level witness that we talk about in the book. And this is a guy whose family is in politics in Nevada. This is a guy that uh, George Knapp figured, uh, I've got to conf- get this story, tr- uh, find out whether it's true or false. What he did is he discovered this guy, and he said, "If this, if this the Area 51 story about the the uh, the uh, live alien and the crafts, if it's true, this guy is going to be able to confirm or deny the story." So what he did is he sort of introduced himself. This guy, he would show up at events where this guy was lecturing or whatever he was doing, or whatever, and he got to sort of know the guy. And then he got to know the guy a little bit better. And then the guy invited him over to his house to look at pictures from the test site, from the nuclear days of the nuclear testing up at the test site where Area 51 is. And and so Knapp tells the story that he goes up to see this guy. And once he gets there, the guy opens up the books and he says, you didn't come here to talk about nuclear tests, did you? And Knapp says, no, not really. And he said, I know what you came here to talk about. You came here to talk about UFOs. And Knapp says, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I came to talk about. And he said it took six months to get this guy to talk. And it was uh, going for breakfast, going for lunch. He wasn't allowed to tape. He wasn't allowed to take notes. So he would go into these little short meetings with this guy having breakfast. And then he would run out and he would furiously write down what the guy had said. And at the end of six months, they were discovered. Somebody discovered they were them meeting together. And the guy was warned off. He was told not to do anything. And what the, the basic core of that story was that eventually the guy said, yeah, it's true. The Lazar story is true. Yeah, we have crafts up there, and we're back engineering these crafts. And then he said, well, Knapp says to him, well, weren't you afraid that the story was going to get out, that it would break? He said, no, we, we weren't. We were afraid it was going to get out. And he said, what do you mean, it? What, you had it? You actually had a live alien there? And the guy said, well, yeah, we had a live alien there, but we didn't know what to do with it. And we were afraid that the thing was going to get away. And uh, so basically, this is the thing. And so when you hear Knapp tell the story, he says, Absolutely, you you can say what you want about Lazar and his background and 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 what happened there, but he's got it from a source that's that is flawless. So that's the part of the story people don't know. And the other thing that 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 we sort of talk about at fairly great length is the fact that um, there was three. They went out for three tests. Uh, Bob Lazar was told when the tests were going to take place. And if you're a rookie, if you're just a, a newcomer into a highly classified program, why would they tell you? when they're going to test the, the, the flying saucer. And so what, of course, he does, he goes and tells Bob, he says, you know, Bob, they're, they're going to fly a, a, a disc tomorrow night. And he said, well, let's go, you know. And so they go out, and they're, they're not on the test site, but they're sort of north of the test site, and they're on this sort of back road off the test site. And uh, Bob, uh, John Lear tells the story uh, that, he had his little, uh, he had the motorhome, they had a bunch of people there in the motorhome, they had a, a eight, eight inch uh, telescope, and he said, ex- he, Lazar said it was going to come up over the mountain at eight, nine o'clock, it p- appeared above the mountain exactly at nine o'clock, right on time, and they watched this thing, John was watching this thing in a telescope, the second night John was flying, he was, a, he was an airline pilot, he was flying, so this is the next Wednesday at, at nine o'clock, the third night, and we tell this whole story about the third night when they get caught. And so they get caught, and um, they, they they get caught twice. They get caught uh, by the security on on the base, and they Lazar is in the in the in the desert. He's not really with them. He he takes off into the desert. He comes back to the car. They go back, and then they're grabbed again by the by the county police uh, when they hit the the main road going back into Las Vegas. And the next morning, Lazar is taken to Indian Springs, which is sort of there where they do security and stuff. And he's taken there and he's threatened and put a gun to his head. And they said, you know, 
Bob, you know, when we told you this was top secret, that we didn't sort of mean that it was meant that you would bring all your friends to watch the tests. And the key there that proves that this thing, that they were actually setting him up, that they were feeding him this material, is at this point, if you got the most highly classified subject in the United States and you have breached the security and you're bringing your friends to watch top secret tests, they throw you in jail. I don't care what anybody says. They, this is game over. What they did with him is they said, well, we're going we're gonna to pull your security clearance for a while. And, I mean, come on, pull your security clearance for a while. I mean, they didn't take his security clearance away. They just said they're going to suspend it for a while. And then he does actually get invited to go back on the test site. They want him to go back to work at the test site, which means that they're ready to feed him some more stuff. And it was at that point that, that Lazar believed that he was being brainwashed, that the, he could remember getting on the Janet plane, he could remember getting off, but he couldn't remember what had happened at work. And he decided, no, he's not going back. So actually Lazar quit. He was not even fired by them, which basically confirms this idea that fits in with a lot of other incidents in UFO history that show that the government is gre- using bad witnesses, bad people, uh, trapdoor things, and they're getting this the, the story out to the American people. And I think that's what happened at Area 51. Okay, that's very interesting. How about the uh, other government involvement that you have mentioned in your book? Uh, the other government involvement, well, there's been a lot. I mean, with the way the book starts, what we do with the book is it's sort of a, a history of what happened um, to me. I had a bunch of settings in 1975. Just as the Vietnam War was ending, uh, just north of the Minuteman, three missile silos on the Canadian side of the U.S.-American border. And uh, so I had the sightings, and it was even back then I sort of realized and I sort of came to the conclusion that sightings was basically a waste of time. That, you know, I could tell my stories, and I had four, per, five pretty dramatic sightings that occurred while I was investigating this flap of sightings. I was there for about a year year and a half. I basically quit university. I figured, like, university is a waste of time. I ran out there and I investigated all this. And at the end, um, I would tell my stories and people would go, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. But, the, you know, it was just a story. They really didn't care about it. So what I wanted to do is all I was interested in is 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 what had I seen and somebody had the answer. I figured, you know, if, if, if I could see this and everybody else in the town was seeing it and it was being in the newspaper, somebody had to know what was going on. So what I did was I went to... Uh, there was a guy who worked in my father. My father worked for the Canadian government for the Department of Transport. He was a pilot. And one of the people in his office had had a sighting in this small town called Carmen where all these UFO sightings were taking place. And he said, well, you know, he says, if you really want to know what's going on with UFOs, you should actually see what the Canadian government was doing back in the early 1950s. I used to work for the guy who ran the Canadian government program. And I said, you did? And I go, wow. And, it's, and he said, yeah. He said, name was Wilbur Smith. And uh, the guy was the smartest guy I ever met in my life. He was just, he was a brilliant guy, but he was, he was crazy. I mean, he was talking to the aliens and he was, uh, yeah, they were landing in his backyard. And I go, wow, you know, like, oh, I got to check this out, you know. So basically I started doing this research and this is where the book starts. It talks about the Canadian government investigation from 1950 to 1954. And at that time it was called, they called it Flying Saucers. The guy that ran the program never used the word UFO the UFO was a term developed by the U.S. Air Force, and I think this guy by the name of Wilbur Smith knew that it was a term to sort of move people away from what was actually going on just to sort of uh, cloud the issue. So he always called the Flying Saucers, and he had this project called Project Magnet. And th- we tell this whole story in the book about how uh, he was a senior radio engineer for the Canadian government, and he, they were negotiating uh, AM-FM frequencies and he was down in Washington. This is in 1950. In September of 1950, he goes down to Washington, D.C., and they're negotiating, I believe that what was happening, they're negotiating FM frequencies between the Americans and the Canadians along the border. And so he's down there, and at that time what had happened was uh, the Canadian guy, uh, Donald, Donald Kehoe, Major Donald Kehoe had come out with the first, his first of his very popular UFO books in 1950. And the second thing that happened was uh, uh, the second book that had been released was uh, the book on the Aztec crash. Uh, so these two very popular books were out at that time. And Wilbur, had, Wilbur Smith had sort of an interest in this, and he had seen these books. So what he did is, is they contacted the military liaison at the Canadian embassy, who's in contact. Because you got to realize that the Canadians, the British, and the Americans – 
have worked on a lot of programs. The atomic bomb, they all worked on together. Uh, Hori- uh, radar, they all worked on together. During World War II, these three countries were working together on a lot of stuff. So they, the Canadians had a military liaison so that if the Canadians were working on something, they could talk to the Americans, we're working on this, we'd like a contact, give us somebody who's working on it in the States so we can work on 